This is going to be quite a story. So fasten your seat belts, fold those tray tables, and put your seats in the upright position. 20 years ago, I worked as a flight attendant, and the flight that made me quit took place from South Bend, Indiana, to Minneapolis. It all started with a rather amusing incident. We had an adult film star on our small regional flight, a 50-seat CRJ. As the only flight attendant, I couldn't help but chuckle at how excited the gate agent was about it. He was clearly a fan. Everything seemed normal, except for the fact that the flight wasn't very full. We took off, and I settled into the jump seat, waiting for the first ding to signal the end of the sterile cockpit rule once we reached over 10,000 feet. However, just when things seemed routine, the vibration system suddenly activated. My reflexes kicked in immediately as I detected a burning smell, even though there was no visible smoky haze. For a brief moment, I thought I might be imagining it. But then, a passenger in front of me made eye contact and gave me a look that confirmed I wasn't the only one smelling it. Oddly enough, nobody else seemed to notice. It struck me as odd that the first three rows were empty despite the flight being only half full. For the first time ever, I reached up and grabbed the phone to the cockpit, hitting the emergency button. This alerted the cockpit crew, but not the passengers, unless they knew what the flashing light above my head meant. The captain's voice came through, distorted by the oxygen masks they were wearing. Sounding like Darth Vader, I whispered into the phone, what the hell is happening? They told me they didn't know and asked me to check behind the galley cart, the lavatory, and then pull up to the avionics bay hatch because they couldn't determine the source of the smell and no alarms were going off. Apparently, air traffic control couldn't confirm from the ground whether we were on fire either. So, as calmly as possible, I moved through the cabin, trying not to attract attention, even though I was beginning to think that we might all meet our demise. My throat burned from inhaling the fumes. Astonishingly, no one seemed to notice, and I was grateful because all three of us crew members were on the same were going to die wavelength. No one on board even batted an eyelash as I crawled on the floor and pulled up the hatch to the avionics bay. I still can't fathom how no one found it strange. There was nothing visible on my side. No fire, no smoke. I called back to the cockpit, and they informed me that we were going to land. And while waiting for clearance, they would vent the cabin to dissipate some of the fumes. At that point, I buckled myself back into the jump seat, attempting not to appear terrified as I faced the 25 passengers in front of me. The captain announced to the aircraft that there were fumes, and we needed to vent them as we made our way back to the airport due to... due to mechanical issues. Yeah, blank stares were aimed in my direction, and I just smiled and nodded as if this were standard procedure. None of this was standard. So, the venting process was supposed to feel like a little puff of air next to your ears, but it felt more like one of those air cannons punching you in the side of your face, which was anything but delightful. But soon after, we were on the ground safely, and I got to work getting everyone off this potential missile to hell so I could have my own private freakout moment. The two pilots and I ended up chain-smoking out in front of the airport, not speaking to each other for about half an hour. What caused all of this was that the engine had been washed out that morning at the maintenance bay, but it hadn't been rinsed or run properly 
to let the chemicals burn off or rinse out. That was what was causing the fumes. An hour later, we were back on the same aircraft and flew back to Minneapolis without any further issues. However, I quit the week after the second scary encounter. Being a flight attendant was tough, especially hearing the warning messages to the captain during takeoff. Imagine being in the jump seat and hearing right behind you, wind shear, wind shear, pull up, pull up, while trying to act like everything is cool. I hated that airline so damn much. Now, shifting gears to a different part of my life, my best friend at school, and I used to visit each other's homes often. His family was always welcoming and kind to me, and I was encouraged to drop by whenever I felt like it. On occasion, I would arrive, and my friend wouldn't be there. But his mom would say, oh hey, come on in. It's great to see you. Why don't you hang out here for a bit? I just have to do a little bit of shopping. So could you keep an eye on the place? There are snacks in the fridge. My friend's mom and my mom were very close, so we had a great relationship between our families. I would often stay at their home if no one was there. This particular experience took place when my mom asked me to go over to my friend's house with some vegetables that our grandmother grew in her garden. It was around lunchtime when I headed over. I rang the doorbell to their home, but no one answered. I assumed that no one was in, which was fine, because I knew where they kept their spare key for emergencies, like the times when they were out and I was sent to return something. I knew to leave it on their living room table, lock up, and return the key where I found it. It was a pretty routine task. So I took the key out and unlocked the door, heading inside. As soon as I got inside, though, I sensed the presence of someone else in the house. With me, I instantly sensed that someone was upstairs. I can't explain it. Maybe I heard a noise or something. It just felt out of the ordinary, since someone should have been downstairs, especially on a Sunday. I assumed it was either my friend or his mom upstairs, perhaps feeling unwell. And then, I somehow convinced myself that one of them had collapsed or something. So, I set the bag of vegetables down in the entryway and carefully headed upstairs. I had a creeping suspicion that there could be a thief or an intruder up there. So I did my best impression of a stealthy ninja. Keep in mind, I was just a kid, so cut me some slack. Let me describe the upstairs floor plan. If you're upstairs, from the back, there's a storage room, my friend's room, and the bathroom. Then there's my friend's mom's room. If you stood at the top of the stairs, you could pretty much see and hear everything that was going on up there. When I quietly reached the top of the stairs, I didn't immediately look inside because I heard a strange sound. It was like pee pee, -pee sound almost like the hiss of air escaping from a deflating tire. It was really weird. I heard the sound travel across the hall towards my friend's room. At that point, I thought, oh man, there's something seriously strange happening here. I don't think it's my friend or his mom making that noise. Still, I summoned my courage and headed towards my friend's room. I can't say if it was carelessness or bravery, but I did it. I leaned my head around the door frame, and what I saw shocked me. There was a man in the room, and he was spitting on the floor. That was the source of the strange sound. It was incredibly gross, and I was completely lost for words. It felt like I was in a dream. The man spun around and looked my way. Surprisingly, he didn't seem at all surprised by my presence. He even greeted me cheerfully, saying, Oh, hello. I felt too awkward to respond with more than a simple hi. I was still very confused. A few seconds passed, or maybe it felt like hours. And then I finally asked, What are you doing? The man 
casually replied, Oh, just keeping my ex in her place, showing her who's boss. This is how you do it. I glanced around my friend's room, and I couldn't believe my eyes. The man's spit covered my friend's toys, his dresser, chest of drawers, and even his clothes in the wardrobe. I was utterly stunned. Here was someone who seemed completely out of their mind, standing in my friend's bedroom. The thought immediately entered my mind. Call the police. I ran downstairs, grabbed my grandmother's vegetables, and sprinted to the police station. Three officers accompanied me back to my friend's house. They headed upstairs, but to my surprise, they couldn't find anyone in the house. My friend and his mom, who had been out, arrived back at their home. To be greeted by the flashing lights of a police car and officers holding notebooks. By the time they heard my story and got the details from the officers, both my friend and his mom were in tears. It turned out that the man I had seen in my friend's bedroom, spitting on everything, was my friend's dad. Apparently, he had been desperately searching for my friend's home after getting divorced from his wife. I had never met someone with so much malice and I never thought that an adult could do such harm to their own flesh and blood. My friend's mom told her son, we will throw out everything he spat on. My friend's initial reaction was anger. He had to be restrained by a compassionate officer. I helped calm him down, and I'm not ashamed to admit that tears filled my eyes too. My family contributed some money to help my friend's mom, as his dad had even spat on his underwear. Can you believe that? We wanted to help, not out of pity, but out of love, a genuine desire to assist. There are good people in the world, and I personally refused to let that man's actions cloud my perception of those who do good. This is why sharing this story is so difficult. There's no clear lesson here, nothing to be gained except disappointment in the man who committed these terrible deeds in his ex-wife's empty house. My dad and my brother took turns picking up my friend and his mom from work, school, and dropping them off since I was too young for a license. The police also made their intentions clear, and my friend's dad never returned. My friend has an older sister, and we suspect that she's still being stalked. It's an ongoing issue, but I'd like to share the current situation. My friend's sister has been staying with my friend for some time now to escape the harassment. She describes it as living in a nightmare, wanting to do something nice for her. I offered to take them both out for dinner, to take their minds off things. We sat down to dinner and everything was going well until I saw my friend's sister's face drop. She began to tremble, and I felt terrible for asking them to come out. Maybe it was too soon. Then she muttered. He sat behind me. I looked behind her, and there was an old man with an unnaturally creepy smile. He was peering towards our table, making me feel nauseous. He was just repulsive. This was the stalker my friend had seen following her sister before, so it was far beyond a coincidence or paranoia. My friend had had enough. She stood up and went over to his table, saying, Loudly, my friend warned, If you don't stop following my sister, then I'm going to the police. A few nearby tables of people looked over, but the old man just sat there, still smiling that insane smile. After a few moments, he got up and left his table, never changing his expression, and just kept smiling. We thought that the public embarrassment might be enough to deter this creep and make him leave my friend's sister alone. We were convinced it would work, and it turned out to be a correct prediction. Over the next few days, we would joke about how easy it was, 
everything came to a standstill for my friend's sister, and a sense of normality returned to her life. However, just as suddenly as it ended, it seemed to start again. This time, the old man's target of torment was different. This time, he was stalking my friend, not her sister, and he had become a bit more cunning in his methods. This time around, the old man began to haunt her life. He would just appear anywhere she went, but always at a distance trying to appear inconspicuous. Let me provide you with some examples. If she was out taking a walk or heading home, the old man would appear on his bike, riding toward her or sneaking up from behind. He would maintain that creepy smile of his as he passed by. He'd be there during rush hour in the subway when crowds gathered, making her feel like there was no escape from him especially in places where it was difficult to move or get away quickly. Enough was enough. My friend went to the police, but unfortunately, they weren't able to help. They claimed that since he hadn't done anything except smile at her and her sister, there was nothing they could do. She left the police station frustrated and feeling vulnerable. The old man's behavior only got worse. He seemed to be everywhere she went, and it was driving her to the brink of despair. She thought, moment, I knew something was terribly wrong. She kept walking, and I kept following, feeling a growing sense of unease. The alley led to a quieter, dimly lit street, and as we walked, I couldn't help but wonder what an innocent child like her was doing in this part of town at this hour. I asked her gently, is everything all right? Is your mother nearby? She remained silent, just shaking her head to indicate no. I tried another question. How about your dad? Is he around? Her face seemed to turn to stone and she still didn't respond. It was then that I noticed the red school bag she was carrying was bulging as if it were filled to the brim. It must have been quite a burden for a child her age. My worry for her deepened as we continued down the dimly lit street. I decided to press further. Can you tell me your name? I want to make sure you're safe. She finally spoke, her voice soft and shaky. I'm Sophie. Sophie, where's your home? I asked, feeling a sense of urgency. She pointed to a nearby alleyway that led to an old, abandoned building. My heart sank. It was clear that she was in danger, and her situation was far from ordinary. I knew I couldn't leave her alone, no matter how late it was or how dangerous the area. Come with me, Sophie, I said firmly. I'll make sure you're safe. We headed towards the alleyway she had pointed to, but I couldn't shake the feeling that we were walking into something dark and unknown. Waistline, making us all the more uneasy, my cook managed to keep him outside and yelled at him to get lost while I was on the phone with the police again, this time describing the man and his bizarre behavior in detail. By the time the police arrived, the man had disappeared into the night, leaving us all shaken and puzzled. They took our statements and promised to patrol the area to ensure our safety. We locked up tight and waited for the adrenaline to subside. Working overnights at a 24-hour diner, you get used to encountering weird people and odd situations, but this night had taken it to a whole new level. The restaurant backed up to a field with a tree line, and my cook and I had gone out back to smoke earlier, where we had heard someone yelling in the distance. We thought it might be one of the many homeless people who pass through our town, usually harmless, so we had dismissed it as just another bizarre occurrence. Later, when I went out to smoke again, and threw 
throw away some trash in the dumpster near the field. I had thought it was safe, considering we hadn't heard that scream again. However, as I walked away from the dumpster, I suddenly heard someone calling out, Hey, come here. It was much closer than when we had heard the initial screams. I hurried inside to get my coworker, who had a car with a spotlight. We shined it into the field, even though we knew it wasn't the smartest move. The guy kept repeating, Hey girl, come here. It was just too weird. By that point, I had already called the police for the first time. As soon as I got off the phone with them, the man emerged from the field. He was an older man wearing a tan trench coat, and my coworker and a customer quickly retreated back inside because this guy was sprinting across the parking lot toward the diner. He started heading for the door, and I had to make another call to the police. My cook intervened, blocking his path and telling him he needed to leave. The man continued to act erratically, yelling at my cook and making threats like, I'll end your life the next time I see you. He kept fidgeting with something under his waistline, adding to our fear and uncertainty. In the end, the police arrived and took our statements, promising to patrol the area to ensure our safety. We locked up tight and waited, our nerves still on edge, hoping the strange man wouldn't return, flash something in his waistband like he was brandishing a weapon but I couldn't see anything from inside. The cops arrived, took him away, and an officer came by to tell us that the guy was homeless and mentally unstable. We shared every detail of what had happened, and my cook pressed charges against him. However, the officer informed us that there wasn't much they could do since the man refused to give them his name. They let him go concluding with a casual, oh, by the way, he's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye. Shortly after, the man returned, sprinting across the neighborhood parking lot and back into the field. His screams of, hey, come here, echoed again and again. We got busier as the bars closed, and we haven't heard from him since. But I know he's still lurking out there because I've caught him sleeping behind the dumpster before my manager arrives in the morning. I plan to convince her to let me retrieve a picture of him from the security tapes to warn the other third shift workers. The field where he's camping out also backs up to a middle school. But the cops once again said there was nothing they could do, hopefully. He moves on and leaves us alone, or the police can catch him doing something that warrants their intervention. This incident happened a few years ago, but it still haunts me when I think about it. For context, I'm a female, and at the time, I was around 25 years old, working in an office with around 150 people. One day, I received an email from a coworker whose name I didn't recognize. The email essentially said something like, I'm sorry if I did something to offend you, given the situation. If you prefer never to see me again, I understand and will avoid you in the kitchen. I was extremely perplexed because I had no idea who this guy was, but it seemed like I had unintentionally offended him somehow. I responded with an apology, explaining that sometimes I zone out, which might come across as rude, and I sincerely apologized. Instead of accepting my apology, he began to get increasingly irritated, acting passive aggressively, and even denying my apology. He was really confusing me with this misunderstanding, so I suggested we resolve it in person big mistake. He agreed to meet me in the office kitchen. As I walked into the kitchen, I immediately spotted a tall guy in his thirties, someone I had seen around the office, 
but didn't know personally. After I explained to him that I had never met him before and had no idea who he was, things took a concerning turn. His face flushed bright red and he appeared visibly angry. He began stuttering and denying my claim, insisting that I had been staring at him for months. He even claimed that when I made eye contact with him, I would gasp and then run away. It was utterly bizarre, and I strongly denied his accusations, stating that it was all a mistake. Despite my denials, he persisted in his strange accusations, becoming increasingly agitated. It became clear that he was unable to see reason, and I decided it was best to end the conversation. Upon reflection, I considered the possibility that he might have thought I was staring at him because of the layout of our office. There is a hallway next to the kitchen, leading to a room with glass walls filled with desks. His desk would have been in direct line of sight if I walked down that hallway. And occasionally, I glanced at his desk because he had a funny sticker on it. However, this seemed like a huge stretch to explain his behavior. Following this incident, a co-worker approached me and asked why I had been talking to him. I explained the situation to her, and she looked genuinely scared. She shared that last year, he had appeared in the office wearing a bathrobe, behaving like a madman and ranting at people. Shockingly, he hadn't been fired for his erratic behavior. It left me wondering if I had been dealing with someone in the midst of psychosis, or if he posed any danger. I had no answers, but I reported the incident immediately to my manager, who took it seriously enough to inform his manager. Fortunately, I believe he no longer works at the company. Two weeks later, I left that company, but I remained extra cautious to avoid any contact with that individual. Now, let me share another unsettling incident that occurred on the 2nd of January. I was asleep in my room in our small apartment in Singapore. It's just my mom, my stepdad, and myself living there. I have my own bedroom as I'm an only child, and my parents took the smaller room. My bedroom has a large window that faces the back of our house. Had goosebumps. I froze because I was unsure of what to do. Since the curtains were wide open, it was evident that this man's intention was to look at me through my window, despite my parents' room being right next to mine. In shock and not knowing what to do, I called my mom for help to check if I was imagining things and to close the curtains for me. After explaining what I had witnessed, she advised me to sleep in the living room for the time being to calm myself down. That night, I felt incredibly uneasy and couldn't go back to sleep. While staying awake in the living room, I heard three more knocks at 3 a.m. and I couldn't help but assume they were coming from my bedroom window. Thankfully, this time, my curtains were already closed, blocking my window's view. Thinking it would be safe, I cautiously approached the window to see who or what had knocked. The only difference this time was that the knock was louder and slower, like the kind you would hear in an old haunted house. In hindsight, I wish I had stayed in the living room with my face and hand pressed against the window. I peered outside to get a closer, clearer look. I hadn't seen a silhouette when standing farther from the window. Still paranoid from the earlier incident, I saw a man standing outside my window, about four meters away, staring directly at me. He stood at an imposing height of around 180 centimeters or more. He was wearing long gray pants and a black t-shirt. His complexion was extremely pale and he seemed to have no expression on his face when he noticed me. At that moment, I was gripped with fear and 
didn't know how to react. Wasn't really sure if it was the same man who had stood outside around 1.30 a.m. As tired as I was that night, I knew I wasn't hearing things or experiencing hallucinations. I was wide awake when I saw that man. The moral of the story is always to check your windows before going to bed. And it's best to use blackout curtains to protect yourself. Now let me share another eerie experience. I am a psychiatrist. And during my training years, I worked for six months at a ward treating patients with depressive and anxiety disorders. The ward was located in an old building that had been housing psychiatric patients since the mid-1920s. On our floor, we had 13 beds, a nursing station, a living room, and a few conference rooms. One day, a few weeks into my assignment, I was interviewing a patient who mentioned hearing a baby crying at night, which would wake her up. There were no babies in that hospital, as the facility was situated far away from housing areas, and there were restricted visiting hours. After the interview, one of the nurses pulled me aside and told me that hearing a baby crying was not a psychotic symptom. She seemed very serious about it, but wouldn't provide further details. I didn't think much of it at the time, as it didn't affect the diagnosis or treatment, and I soon forgot about the experience. Around three months later, I was sitting in the nurse's station, and three nurses were talking behind me. One of them remarked, she's very active today. Another nurse responded, really? Oh, I hadn't noticed. I turned around and asked them whom they were talking about. They exchanged glances, and then one of them hesitantly replied, well, there is a baby here. She cries sometimes. I immediately denied it, but they just shrugged and smiled. Not 30 seconds later, I heard it, a faint baby's cry. It sounded distant, but not too far away, as if separated from us by maybe two or three walls. I was perplexed and looked at the nurses. They gazed back at me as if saying, told you so. I asked for more information, but they couldn't provide any other details. This faint baby's cry had always been there, and they just accepted it. Since then, I heard it maybe two to three times a week. I informed a new doctor about it, who initially didn't believe me. However, a few weeks into her stay, she came to me, visibly shaken, and confessed that she heard it too during her coffee break. All the nurses seemed to know about it, but it was not something they openly discussed. In the field of psychiatry, hearing such things isn't something you boast about. I was later transferred, and I haven't heard it since. I still think about it from time to time, but I don't really know what to make of it. Now let me share another unsettling experience from a couple of years ago when I was around 26. This occurred in a big city focused on getting to the vet ASAP. I was wearing a mask because it was in the middle of the worst part of the pandemic, and I had on a t-shirt with my university's logo. I locked eyes with a guy on the sidewalk heading in the opposite direction, and he came up to me while I was walking. He said, you went to NYU? I replied, yes and he started walking with me along the sidewalk in the opposite direction he was initially headed. He walked right by my side, explaining how great of a school NYU was and how he was in grad school there. Something about it felt off because he looked to be in his 30s and he didn't seem to know much about the college, providing no specific details. He began asking me more questions and at this point, I was speed walking down the block, but he just kept walking right next to me. My dog was getting increasingly antsy, and I felt incredibly uncomfortable.
because I had no clue who this guy was or why he was trying to walk with me on a busy sidewalk. Suddenly, my dog started barking and growling aggressively at him, but he didn't seem to care and continued walking with me. After about five to 10 city blocks, with me trying to restrain my dog from growling and barking and him persistently asking questions, I finally explained that I was going to a vet appointment. However, I was still nervous. He then asked, can I see you without your mask? I firmly said no, to which he reacted with raised eyebrows, appearing shocked. He kept pushing, but I continued to flatly tell him no. Then he suggested that we go get coffee together and invited me to go with him. I declined mentioning that I had a boyfriend and assured him that I was getting engaged soon. Despite my dog's aggressive barking, he persisted. Finally, after about 10 blocks, he realized I was taken and departed, leaving me alone. While the most likely explanation is that this guy thought I was attractive and wanted to ask me out on a date, his behavior was unsettling. I still remember this encounter years later, as it made a lasting impression. Now, let me share another story from when I was around 12. I lived with my mother in a granny flat that was connected to an older person's house, built by his son. The neighbor was called. Harry, the neighbor, had three ways to enter the yard. One through his backyard, one through the driveway, and the main entrance. The gate at the driveway was broken, and we kept Harry's gate blocked. Harry was an odd guy, around 70 years old, and he always gave me and my mom the creeps. I remember one day when my mom and I were outside, he started talking to us over the gate. He even got on what we later learned was a step stool. My mom told me to go inside. Another time, when I was taking out the rubbish, I turned around, and he was right behind me, just staring. I tried to leave, but he dragged me into a conversation. After a while, my mom showed up and asked what took so long. When she saw Harry, she told me to go into the house. When she came back, she told me that if he ever did that again, I should run away. The third thing I remember is when I was home alone, and I heard the gate open took a look outside and saw Harry walking around the yard. I ran into my mom's room and stayed quiet. After a while, I heard knocking, and then the gate opened and shut, indicating that he had left. The final issue was when my mom and I were mowing the lawn. I felt like I was being watched, and when I looked up, there was Harry standing near his back door, just staring. After a minute, my mom noticed that I was staring at something and looked up. She immediately got mad, told me to get inside and lock the door. My mom started yelling at him saying, what are you doing? Go away, leave us alone. If you keep this up, I'm calling the cops. I don't really remember what happened next, but after a few months, we moved and it was the biggest relief ever. My mom told Harry's son what had happened after she yelled at him. And I'm guessing the son told his dad to leave us alone. It was definitely creepy. Now let's continue with Jake's story. Jake had recently transferred from a big department in California and landed himself randomly at our department. It didn't make much sense as to why he left California in the first place, but he always insisted it was just time for him to move to a smaller and less dangerous department. He and I, I reached out to my local authorities and shared the details of Jake's persistent harassment and inappropriate actions. They advised me to document every interaction and keep any evidence of his behavior, which I had been doing diligently. Around this time, I also decided to confide in a few close friends about the situation, 
and they encouraged me to file for a restraining order against Jake. With their support, I followed through with the legal process, and the court granted me a restraining order to keep him away from me. Despite this, Jake's relentless pursuit continued. He found ways to contact me through different phone numbers and online platforms, using aliases and disguises. His messages grew increasingly threatening, leaving me in constant fear for my safety. I continued to report these incidents to the authorities, but it felt like a never-ending battle. Jake seemed determined to make my life a living nightmare. His actions were not only disturbing, but also a clear violation of the law. I sought assistance from cybercrime units, who began investigating his online activities. It was discovered that he had been using various tactics to hide his identity while harassing me. The investigation was ongoing, and I had to remain vigilant. My friends and family rallied around me, providing emotional support during this challenging time. We were all determined to put an end to Jake's harassment once and for all. The legal process was slow, but I held on to the hope that justice would eventually prevail. Throughout this ordeal, I learned the importance of taking threats and harassment seriously, as well as the significance of seeking help and support from loved ones and law enforcement. I also understood the value of documenting evidence and maintaining a record of all interactions, which ultimately played a crucial role in building a case against Jake. It's clear that you have been dealing with a persistent and disturbing situation involving Jake, from his unwelcome advances to his attempts to track your location and continuously contacting you. It's understandable why you're concerned about potential stalking. Stalking typically involves unwanted and repeated attention or harassment that causes fear or distress to the victim. In your case, Jake's relentless pursuit, despite your clear rejection and the legal actions you've taken, raises significant red flags. His efforts to contact you through various means and to appear in your vicinity without a legitimate reason are cause for concern. Given the pattern of Jake's behavior and the ongoing distress it has caused you, it's crucial to continue documenting every interaction as you've been doing. Inform law enforcement about his recent appearances in your area, especially if he lives far away from your location. Stalking laws vary by jurisdiction, but authorities may be able to take action to protect you further. Consider discussing this matter with your support network, including friends, family, and possibly a counselor or therapist who can provide emotional support and guidance on dealing with the situation. Keep your safety a top priority and do not engage with Jake or respond to any further attempts at contact. If Jake's actions persist or escalate, do not hesitate to seek legal assistance and explore additional options for your safety such as obtaining a restraining order or protective measures from law enforcement. Stay vigilant, stay safe, and continue to take proactive steps to protect yourself from any potential harm. I'm concerned about Jake's behavior. He's been persistent in contacting you even after you've blocked him multiple times. The fact that he's trying to follow you on social media and has appeared in your area despite living quite far away previously, raises some red flags. While I'm not an expert in stalking, this does seem like unwanted and intrusive behavior. It's essential to prioritize your safety and well-being. If Jake's actions continue to make you uncomfortable or escalate further, it may be wise to consult with law enforcement or a legal professional 
to understand your options and take appropriate steps to ensure your safety. Please take any necessary precautions to protect yourself and don't hesitate to seek help or advice from authorities if you feel threatened or harassed by Jake's actions. Your safety and peace of mind are paramount.